Online Church, Pastor Ed Newton, San Antonio, Texas. Our main campus here at the Gold Canyon location and to all our campuses and to all the faith followers that watch from abroad, we are so thankful for your investment. The fact that you would link up and lock into what God is doing, a part of this movement, we are blessed because of you. And this message series has co continued to reverberate, not only in our city, but across the nation. As the word is getting out in regards to this message of radical generosity, it has truly been supernatural to watch the fruit of people responding in faithfulness. We know that God's message today is going to impact you greatly, and we would love to hear from you personally. You can email us at nextstepsatcommunitybible.com, or you can visit us online at communitybible.com backslash nextsteps. Until we meet again, much love. In the spirit of Pentecost, that is, today we celebrate on the calendar, Pentecost weekend, kingdom fire, mobilizing the hearts of many to be about a mission much bigger than ourselves. We send out in these days, literally, 12 mission teams going all over the world. It's a part of our strategy. That is the front porch, come and see. The living room, come and sit and be in community. The kitchen, come and serve. The back porch, come and be sent. Not just sending people on mission, members on mission, but also starting churches. You may not know this. Oftentimes you hear me reference and mention our multiple campuses. We've had one campus called CBC Borgfeld. Now this church has started a lot of churches throughout its history. But in current context, one particular church, CBC Borgfeld, led by Pastor John Stotzenberger, that is for the past year and six or seven months, they get the message from Saturday night, it's recorded, and they watch it on Sunday at 9 and even in this hour at 11 o'clock. As I'm speaking, they're watching me on video. It's crazy. However, as we go forward, what we're asking Pastor John Stotzenberger to do is to walk in the anointing that he has and to be the primary communicator starting this coming August. Therefore, we need a bolstered effort to continue to reach the northern part of this city de demographic that we've been given. But now, also, we're bringing in another campus, not just to reach the north side, but to reach the south side. And as we do that, I'm proud to announce to you CBC Highland Park, led by Pastor Brian Thomas. So right now, I want you to hear from these two brothers, Pastor Brian, Pastor John. Why don't you come join me on the stage and share your heart. Come on, church, let them know how grateful we are. Thank you, brother. I bless you guys. Thank you so much. Pastor John. Yeah, look at this. Yeah. Amen. Wow. I'm not sure how to react Standing to this. Standing ovation. Wow. wow. Uh, I'm going to say this for both Brian and I. Thank you. That's, Thank you. Uh, yes. Wow. My voice is even low. That's why I love this wow. church. Okay. Man. Goosebumps under this coat right yes. now. Um, so, at CBC Borgfeld, we have a, a question that we ask each other, sort of a, an accountability question, an encouraging question. It is this. It is, what are you hearing? Mm. And the reference is, what is the Holy Spirit telling you? Because it's when we start to obey and heed the Holy Spirit is when things start to happen in our communities, whether it be at Highland Park, yeah. Gold Canyon, or Borgfeld. So with that, one of the great, tremendous joys of the journey has been seeing the people of Borgfeld start to hear that still, small voice, mm. to be still and know as he is God, and to understand that they are called, they are equipped, and they are empowered. And yeah. that has been so exciting to do. So my question for you today is, what are you hearing? Yeah. What's the Spirit poking at you? So I'll share with you briefly. So uh, this morning, a gentleman shared with my wife that when he goes to church here at Gold Canyon, he, you know, technology people, even though he knows the way here, he likes to tell his GPS in his car, go to church. And it automatically, it puts in CBC Gold Canyon and Amen. it takes him to church. Thank you, so Siri. this morning he told it, go to church. True story. It took him to Borgfeld. Hello. <laughs> yeah, come on. So he's like, no, no, no. He comes to church here, and then this happened. Yes. And it was at that point he shared with my wife out there at the table that uh, 
Yes, Lord, got it. Amen. So maybe the Holy Spirit yes. is talking to you in that still it. small voice of your GPS. I don't know, but what are you hearing? Come on. Thank you, Pastor John. That's a good word, Pastor Brian. <laughs> so exciting Amen. to see what God is doing. I come this morning to share some good news. You know what it is? Tell us. Do you know what it is? Tell us. Let me tell you, since you asked. Yeah. I was able to trace my family history and story, and I didn't even have to use Ancestry.com. <laughs> See, at our church family, CBC Highland Park, we are connected to this family. Yeah. We have been born of the same DNA. Yes. In fact, nine years ago, we were birthed from that DNA cool. to reach and minister hungry lives on the southeast side of San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. Come on. And because of the heart of this senior pastor, Ed Newton, mm. today, because of his visionary leadership, I'm happy to declare that we are reunited yeah. as family today with this family. Yes. Come on. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, I would sing Reunited by Peaches and Her, but I don't think that's part of the song set for today, so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but some of y'all remember that, though, right? <laughs> On the southeast and the east side of San Antonio, you have some amazing people that are hungry for the love of Jesus. They're hungry to be touched and with his hope and his healing. They're hungry for Jesus, but they're not only hungry for Jesus, sometimes they're hungry for bread. And toilet paper, no kidding. And some of the basic necessities of life. And so we're able to touch people exactly where they are, where, whatever need they have. If that's through inviting them through our 1 o'clock service on Sunday or servicing their needs through our food pantry or thrift store, we're able to do that. We're able to meet them right where they are. But, but here's the thing. Our aim is not to build bigger buildings and, and necessarily just better and, uh, programs. We're not just about that, although we're interested in that and providing great ministry. But we want to go beyond the four walls. We want to blow the doors off of the four walls of our yeah. building, get outside yeah. of the four walls. Yeah. Because many of you realize that a lot of people are not coming to church. Well, we are the church, and we're going to take Jesus to them. Is that all right? Yeah. Come on. But here's the appeal for you. As I close, San Antonio has some incredible men and women, heroes, and they're called first responders. Mm -hmm. You know those individuals? Give it up. We probably have some first responders here today, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to those heroic men and women who are running into the burning building, who are running into tragedy while we are running to escape. But here's the appeal. We need some spiritual first responders who are not afraid of the declining demographics, who are not afraid of the negative trends or the nightly news about this sector of San Antonio. We're looking for some courageous, spiritual first responders that will say, yes, Lord, yeah. I'm willing to go in yes. and do what you have for me to do. Yeah. Is that you today? Amen. Amen. Pastor Brian, Pastor John, won't you come stand with me? This is significant. Here's the reason why. Because I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church where the senior pastor said, I need you to leave this church and go to someone else's church. Now, some of you are looking at me like, Pastor Ed, I've never heard that before in my entire life. The first time I ever heard it was from my mentor. I was 21 years old. And I went, did he just ask people to leave our church and to be a part of a church plant? And when that happened, my heart just went, no, he didn't, but yes, he did. And that's the most kingdom-minded thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And it literally reverberated in my soul and just caused me to go, that's why I love my church. Here's what I'm saying to you. While these brothers were speaking, and I love the illustration that John shared, very clear, that God may be calling some of you. It doesn't mean everybody. But God may be calling some of you either for a season or for a lifetime to be a part of either CBC Highland Park or CBC Borgfeld, 
And in the process of that, we're asking you to say yes to whatever the Holy Spirit of God is saying to you. So at the end of this service, the radical generosity piece of this day's emphasis is giving away our greatest asset, and that's our people. Our people. So my prayer is that many of you would just be synced in and sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God to go, I'll help you on the south side or I'll help you on the north side to take the gospel of Jesus Christ through the flavor of what we consider the special sauce of CBC into these locations. And my prayer is that you would say yes. So let's pray for these brothers and ask God's richest blessing. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Brian. I thank you for Pastor John. I thank you that... As we begin to study together in August, preaching the very same things all across our CBC locations, God, I got so much to learn from Brian, so much to learn from John, and we just want to simply honor you. And I thank you for the influence that you've given us in this city to make much of you. God, as I looked at that map, God, would you give us CBC locations all over this city is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together one more time. Show some love to Pastor John. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you guys. Incredible. Well, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and meet together. Luke chapter 12 is our focus passage. As you're turning there, reality television has struck a gold mine on shows such as American Pickers, Auction Hunters, Auction Kings, Buried Treasure, Flea Market Flip, Junk Gypsies, Junkyard Wars, Picker Sisters, Storage Wars, and not to be outdone because you know this in Texas, we got to have our own edition of everything, Storage Wars, Texas Edition. (laughs) And that is, there's an industry that is recession resistant, and I don't know if you have invested in this, many of us have, it's called what would be simply entitled Storage Units. Do you know that the storage unit industry generated nearly $24 billion in 2014? Reminding us all that we might have just a little bit too much than what we need. Do you know that 93% of the world, that is you and I are richer than 93% of the world if we have a roof over our head and a meal that we will enjoy today, just one. We're richer than 93% of the world. Do you know that we are richer than 75% of the world if we just have a pair of shoes on our feet right now? You say, Pastor Ed, flip-flops count? One, that's what I love about our church. You can come just as you are. But whatever foot apparatus you have on right now, if you have anything covering your feet, you're richer than 75% of the world, which means to much is given, much is required. And I want to talk about the subtle sin of greed and covetousness. And today in Luke chapter 12, we see this word in the teachings of Jesus found beginning in verse 13. And if you're with me, 11 o'clock service, come on, say amen. Amen. The Bible teaches someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, Who made you or made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, let me just real quickly, drive by statement, let me make this observation. Jesus is teaching in what's known as monologue style. That means he's talking. It's a one-way conversation. He's speaking about the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, he's telling people, be watchful of the Pharisees. That is, they were lauding and parading in their religiosity, a superiority over everyday people. Jesus would say, don't follow them. Follow me. Right in the middle of that teaching, a gentleman stands, begins to speak. So put it in this context. While I'm speaking, someone's standing, saying, teacher, and this is the phrase mentioned to Jesus, could you tell my brother, and it was probably a moment like, could you tell my brother? Right now, to make sure he divides the inheritance. As to say, our father has died and the inheritance is being distributed, but he's getting more than I, and I need you to fix this. It's simply a reminder that in 20 years of ministry, I've been ordained as a 
minister since 1997, 20 years. Never in 20 years have I ever sat across the desk from someone who said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I have a greedy heart. Or I struggle with covetousness. No one has ever looked at me and said, this is my issue, this is my struggle. Why? Because we understand that there are, if you will, prevalent sins. And then there are subtle sins. And Jesus speaks to our heart. And I want to show you a couple concepts. If you have a listener guide, I want you to write down in point number one, I want you to notice the deception of gaining. The deception of gaining. You can keep it. The very reason why I put the quote right above point number one is to remind you, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The deception of gaining is you can keep it. You can take it with you. The story and the analogy was given of a husband that looked to his wife and said, now, when I die, I need you to make sure that you put all the money that I've earned in that casket and make sure it's closed because I'm going to take my money with me to heaven. She responded, whatever you say, sweetie. Well, that day came and that memorial service took place. And right before that casket was closed by the funeral director, this widow stood up, placed a box on the inside of that casket and closed it. She sat down, her friend next to her, making these remarks. She said these words to the widow, surely you didn't do what he asked you to do. You know he can't take that money with him to heaven. She says, I'm a man, or excuse me, I'm a woman of my word. I've always been respectful, kind, and considerate. I've sought to honor my man. And all of a sudden, in that moment, she goes, you know, her friend says this to the widow, you know he can't take that with him. She goes, I know that. So why did you do it, came the question. She goes, oh, I didn't put the cash in the casket. I wrote a check. (laughs) He could cash it later. The deception of gaining. You think you could take it with you. Now, you know I used to say this analogy. You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul attached to it until I saw a hearse with a U-Haul attached to it. It was repurposed. And therefore, understand the significance of gaining has to be repurposed. That we would not live with the mentality of, I'm going to keep all that I have. But instead, that we would live with this teaching that we've been talking about the past several weeks of radical generosity. But I want us to begin to focus in on verse 15. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. The Bible says, And he said to them, Take care, as to say, be vigilant, and be on your guard. Be diligent. Vigilant and diligent. Why? Because greed and covetousness is a sneaky sin. It begins to infiltrate What is covetousness? It is an increasing desire and a decreasing satisfaction. Covetousness in the root concept with an analogy attached to it is a thirst that cannot be quenched. The image would be a person in the ocean dying of dehydration but surrounded by water thinking That if I just drank the ocean water, I would be satisfied when in reality the salt content would create a craving that could not be quenched. That is, covetousness is in the same conversation as gluttony. As gluttony longs for food to satisfy, but yet is not satisfied. So is covetousness. It's the mindset of, I don't mind someone else being blessed, but God, why did you skip over me in the distribution of the blessing? And so all of a sudden we see the casualness of covetousness. That is, that casualness causes us to look at this next phrase. It says, against all covetousness. That is, we understand there are different forms of this concept to covet. That is, it could be a position, not just possessions, but a position. It could be privileges. It could be power, 
It can go beyond even possessions to platforms. It's in that moment that we see that someone else has something that we want and to take that is illegitimate and therefore we seek to fulfill legitimate needs in illegitimate ways, which is the definition of covetousness. But point number two or letter B, not only do you see the casualness of covetousness, but I want you to notice letter B, the persuasiveness of possessions. The persuasiveness of of possessions. That is, oftentimes what we have defines us. It defines our worth. Can I just make this statement? Your worth does not come from what you drive, what you wear, where you live, what you have tucked away in a 401k, the degrees on a wall. Your worth does not come from what you own. Your worth comes from the one who owns you, King Jesus, that owns the whole world, but the one thing he was missing was you. So he pursued you, chased after you, called you by name. And anytime we take the blessing of God in material items and we consume them for the purpose of our identity, then it equals idolatry. We're no different than the nation of Israel that plundered the Egyptians from the gold with the specific command, use the gold from Egypt to build a house for my name. But what did they do? They stopped before they got to that finished product and instead they formed and fashioned a golden calf. Now you wouldn't have the audacity to build a golden calf and worship it, but instead we just drive it, live in it, wear it, and we find our identity from it. Now, moms and dads, all the moms and the dads in the house, want you to just raise your hand so I could see you. Any moms and dads in the house having the conversation with your kids about social media? Hello. That moment where you got to look at your kids and go, your worth does not come from the number of followers you have on Instagram. Or your worth does not come from the fact that you posted a really cool picture of our family and you only got 14 likes and you take it down because you didn't get 100? Oh, but oftentimes as I'm pointing at my kids, I got four fingers pointing back at me going, I do the same thing. We find our identity by what we possess. And Jesus says your value does not come from the abundance of your possessions. It drives wealth. There's nothing wrong with owning things. The problem is, is when they own you. Nothing wrong with being wealthy, rich. Covetousness is an equal opportunity offender. As we are in the NBA finals, and I wish our Spurs were a part of the conversation today. But the Warriors and the Cavaliers will play, and I had a quote that I thought was so significant by LeBron James, multiple MVPs, three M NBA championships. Here's what he said. When you hold up the trophy, confetti falls. You pop the champagne, there's a parade. All of that lasts about 48 hours, and everybody else goes back to their life. He said, but that feeling that you get in those 48 hours drives you to get it again. My question, and I appreciate the tenacity of LeBron James and his profession, but the problem is, what do we do when we can't get that again? Do we become content with what we have been given? And that leads us to point number two. Not only do we see the deception of gaining, you could keep it, but I want you to notice point number two, the delight in losing. The delight in losing. That is, that's a contradictory term. The delight in losing. Here's the phrase. You will enjoy it. Notice in verse 31, Luke chapter 12, verse 31. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What is he saying? This delight in losing, you'll enjoy it. It's a call to contentment. Letter A, point number two, the call to contentment. Seek first 
his kingdom. It's a priority to make him first and foremost. Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Therefore, when you pursue God, make him first and foremost, what is the Bible saying? God already knows your needs before you even ask them, which is why he says, fear not, little flock. As to say, I got this. If I could speak the world into existence, could I not speak into existence the very things that you need in this life? But the problem is this, oftentimes we seek the stuff, what's in the hand of God versus what's in the heart of God. And when we seek what's in the heart of God, don't you know it's his good pleasure to bestow upon you the keys to the kingdom, the blessing and the favor and the anointing and the authority that this world cannot offer. I wrote down this simple statement. It's not my own. People satisfied with things that money can buy are in danger of losing things money can't buy. What do you cherish? What do you choose? What do you chase after? Reveals our heart. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. Now, before I was called to ministry, I wanted to work as a sales representative for Nike. How many of you are in the sales industry as a profession? Would you just raise your hand right where you're seated or standing? I wanted to be you. I wanted to work for a company that I believed in to market and convince and persuade people the need that they would have for the product that I was selling. So I wanted to work for a company that I had no problem speaking about, and that would be Nike. I I had a cousin who worked for Marlboro, and I saw all the the flow and the hookup and all the T-shirts and the bags, the swag, as some would say. And I went, I want all of that. I just want it to be Nike. (laughs) Now, with that analogy, can I make this statement? I'm still in sales. I just work for a bigger company. And I'm not talking about CBC. I'm talking about God. I'm still trying to persuade and influence people to trust in the one who did it, not just do it. He did it on the cross of Calvary for us. But let me use this analogy. We've always been told to have a diversified portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's wise counsel. But what if I were to liquidate all my financial capital that I have in savings and went, I'm going all in on Nike. I'm just going to invest everything I have to be a shareholder in Nike. Don't you think I would be consumed by the stock market report considering and consulting the effects of Nike in the marketplace? Don't you think as I went across the street to Academy Sports, which is a great store, to walk in and go, okay, there's Under Armour, there's Reebok, there's Puma, there's Adidas. No, 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 no. I'm walking and I'm purchasing Nike because as I buy Nike, it's only allowing our company to do better that I'm invested in. Matter of fact, if I saw someone else not wearing Nike, I would try to convince you to go buy Nike. Every day I would wake up and go to Nike.com to see what was going on. My whole world would be consumed with Nike if I liquidated everything I had and invested in this company. But let me use that analogy to put it into kingdom things. Since I've given my life to Jesus and I'm all in, would I not be consumed about Jesus beyond just Sunday? Would I be consumed with his word every single day? Would I treasure making his name and fame known? Would I try to convince people, hey, listen, I'm telling you, you need to be with him because he's legitimate, he's real, he's forgiving, he's salvation. Would I not seek to give my entire life to making people know the one who knows me and yet radically pursues me? He doesn't just love you. He likes you too. And in the process of that, my whole world would be consumed by that. Jesus is saying, if you allow your whole world to be consumed by me, that is, if it's your joy to put everything you have into the hands of God, watch this. If it's your joy to put everything you have into the hands of God, what you'll see is God's hand in everything. In everything. 
That's the truth of what he's speaking about. So not only do we see this call to contentment, we see the peace of preservation. The peace of preservation. Now in verse 33, here's what we find out. In verse 33, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. That's the preservation. With treasure in heaven that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. The peace of preservation. That as you invest in the kingdom, that is making Jesus known and famous in your circles of influence, it is paid forward. It will last beyond this life into the next. And let me just see if I could illustrate this real quickly. We used to live in Orlando, Florida. My wife and I, before we moved to the great state of Texas, to the great city of San Antonio, and to be with the most amazing people in all the world, and that is Community Bible Church, that being you. In the process of that, on Sunday nights after church in Orlando, Florida, we would go to a pizza parlor by the name of Stevie B's. Great location. Great pizza and video games for our kids to play. And so over a period of time, here's what began to happen. My kids were ask, would ask me, Dad, can we have some tokens for the arcade? I give $5. That doesn't divvy up amongst four kids a whole lot. I, I just didn't know. I didn't want to invest a whole lot of tokens into a pizza place. I didn't know we we're going to come back to but we began to come back every single weekend. Every time we placed our order, a part of the presentation and the sales pitch was, would you like some tokens? And I remember looking at this chart of, if you give this amount of money towards tokens, you can get this amount of tokens. As to say, the more you buy in bulk, the more advantageous it would be for you to go all in on some tokens. And one day, I'm so embarrassed to say this, one day, I bought $50 worth of tokens. I love Stevie B's. I was like, if we don't use them today, we're going to come back and back and back. And so $50 worth of tokens basically gave me a thermos, a container to put tokens in. It was massive. So you can just imagine me walking around. Oh, y'all need tokens? Just distributing graciously, generously tokens. And then just took that thermos of tokens, put it in our center console. I don't know how it works in your vehicle. All of life is in the center console of our our vehicle. One particular Sunday evening, we're pulling into the parking lot. Lights are dim and Stevie B's. No cars in the parking lot. I'm like, something must have happened. Walk up, got my thermos of tokens. Walk up to the door. Oh, no, you didn't. Y'all went out of business? I don't know if you've ever talked out loud to yourself, but I'm like, what am I going to do with these tokens? Got nowhere to spend them. Now, let me just pause and put this in a parenthetical statement. CBC, the reason why we're having this message is because I don't want you to get to heaven and go, why didn't I spend all this? Why didn't I invest all of this gifting and this blessing that you've given me? You should have went all in on this earth. And please, I'm not talking about fiscal irresponsibility. I'm just talking about radical generosity that you would not hoard, but instead you would release. And you'll find out the kingdom principle that when you release, he bestows back on you to give again. Now watch this. So one particular Sunday evening, we went to another pizza place called CC's. I took one token, put it in my pocket. I had a plan. Now, my wife, as we kept the token container in our center console, my wife, every once in a while, Stephanie, who was singing on stage, she would rattle the tokens every once in a while while we were running errands just to remind me of my stupidity (laughs) of buying those tokens. She would reach in for a pen, put her hand in the bucket, and go, oh, do you remember when you bought all these tokens? (laughs) So I had a plan. I put that token in my pocket. We went into CC's. And at that moment, I saw that arcade, and I asked my daughter, I said, I said, London, I need you to go see if one of these tokens will work (laughs) in one of those games. All of a sudden, she comes back. She goes, Dad, it works. (laughs) I go, I'll be right back. We're all in. 
We're staying and we're playing. We're cashing all in. I know for some of you, you go, and that's our pastor right there. I, 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 somewhere in the midst of this is a spiritual truth that I, I don't know where it all lands. I just know this, that, that concept of you finding a place where it works and it fits, you know what God has deemed and, and crafted? It's the church of Jesus Christ. And therefore, and I'm not talking about your money. Please do not misconstrued this concept, I'm really talking more about you, your talents, your gifts, your abilities, you, that makes you unique to the story of God to be carried in a way that I can't carry it, to go into your marketplace, your workplace, into those locations, those schools, wherever it may be, and that you would go all in with everything that you have with your life. And when you do that, you'll find out you won't stand before God and go, I wish I would have done more. Here's what I want to teach you today. That the sin of covetousness is simply a sneaky sin. Jesus would use a parable about a man that would build a barn. As a matter of fact, he would be so wealthy in that he would use 11 pronouns in reference to what should I do. Listen to the story found in Luke 12 real quickly in verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. Verse 17, and he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? He said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, And be merry. But God said to him, Fool, like Mr. T style, (laughs) this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? As they say, you can't take it from take it with you, and ultimately somebody will take it from you, and you can't take this to heaven. Here's the statement. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Was Jesus condemning the man being prudent, being an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. He was not condemning his success. He's condemning the 11 personal pronouns that was all about I, me, my, mine. That's what he was condemning. So what's the takeaway? In this parable, you did not hear the man say, thank you, God. In this parable, you did not hear the man be generous towards others. In this parable, you didn't hear the man say, God, give me guidance in what you want me to do with what I have in the storehouse. Which led me to these two questions I put in your listener, God. Why do I have so much? And why has God given me more than I need? In closing, I got no problem on a daily basis pounding on the door of heaven. God, I got needs. Anybody else? I mean, I pound on the door of heaven. God, I got needs. I got wants. But I'm honestly standing before you, really not preaching a message to you. I'm really preaching this message to me. Because when Jesus said, and I believe verse 33, go sell your possessions. When I was reading this in my personal study, can I just be honest, transparent about how I responded? I was like, Holy Spirit of God, could you be more specific? And you know what it revealed? My greediness. So I'll be the first one today to say, I have a greedy heart at times. So what do I do in response to that? I have to come to a place in my life where I live a life of gratitude. It combats a greedy heart. I come to the point in my life where I ask God for guidance on the surplus in my life. God, what do you want me to do with what you have blessed me with? Who do you want me to be generous to? What do you want me to be generous with? Which leads us to this place. Could we be audacious enough to ask these questions so that we don't look back on our life and have wasted our life stockpiling things that we can't take with us to heaven. 
The only moment we've been promised is right here, right now. Every breath we have is a gift. And therefore, as we seek to live a life with radical generosity, may we come to this place where we embrace this last statement. In your listener guide right here at the very bottom, we are not hesitant to tell God what we need. Therefore, why are we so hesitant to ask God what we need to do with the excess? God's leading you to a point of decision. And how that manifests itself will be completely different for everybody else in this room. But in this moment, here's what I'm going to ask. That you and I would consider the challenge that's already been given. That some of you would consider the call to help us at the CBC Borgfeld campus or the CBC Highland Park campus. And this is full, like all cards on the table. Everything in me, I oftentimes have prayed, Lord, more influence, more impact, your kingdom advance through my family, my life, this church. And you've heard me say this, God, let us have more services, more people. We'll do this seven times, eight times, nine times. I'll preach as many times as you want me to. And the Holy Spirit of God said something, and I just need you to listen. I'm I'm just kind of having a confession moment right now. The Holy Spirit of God just said, Ed, would you be okay with just you if it was my will for just one service that you preach and have six churches in the city? And I went, Lord, I I know the answer you want me to say, but that would make me look like a failure. That would cause people to rumor about me, gossip about me, spreading rumors concerning the fact that he used to preach five services, now he preaches one. But could I not worry about what people think and go, you know what, the greatest form of leadership in this church is not what we do in here, but what we do outside of here, that we would gather and we would scatter. And if it is the Lord's will that I only preach one service at the 11 o'clock hour, that we would, we would have churches all across this city. And when I look at that map, I would much rather be a pastor that was leading a movement that had churches all across this city versus y'all come just hear me talk. Y'all just come hear me talk. But instead, I'd pour my life into these men, teaching them how to preach and teach and communicate in the way that's unique. to. I got a lot to learn from them. But I could at one point, you would see this, that on this stage, we'd have 12, 13, 14 pastors on this church. You know why? Because their church started another church. And that church started another church. And we are taking this CBC flavor and influencing the entire city. You know how risky this message is? You know how risky this message is to go, hey, the Holy Spirit's telling you to let Pastor Brian be your pastor. I say yes and amen. You know how risky it is for me to go, hey, if God's calling you to be under the teaching and the leadership of Pastor John, I say yes and amen, and I'll celebrate that. You know why? Because we gain by losing. Here's the reason why. Because if we don't put churches in these places, do we honestly think folks from the south side going to come here? Now, some of you do. But how about this? How about we be the church and we take the church to them? Let's not assume that people are going to fight the traffic that we got going on. But instead, let's take church to them. And I believe in this room are some people that are saying yes and amen to that call. So with heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment. We always want to close our message with a time of invitation to receive Jesus. And if you've never done that before, we want to give you that opportunity. If you've never done that, it's simple as admitting that you're not perfect. All of us fall into that category. It's believing that Jesus died for us. And it's calling on his name. If you've never done that before today, we invite you to do so. And if that is your decision to walk away from religion and to trust Jesus as your Savior. Would you just say this to him? Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe that you died for me. And right now, I'm asking you to save me, change me. I give you my life. With heads bowed, eyes closed today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, today is your day of salvation. And we want to rejoice with you 
with the angels of heaven that celebrate you and let you know it's the greatest decision that you've ever made. And if you've done that today and it's legitimate, it's real, would you just raise your hand right where you're seated or right where you're standing? How many of you would say, Pastor Ed, today I gave my life to Jesus. I made that decision. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else today would just be honest. Thank you, ladies in the back. Thank you, sir. Anybody else today? that would join in with these bold, courageous people that would say, today I just gave my life to Jesus. For those of you that have your hand raised, you can put your hand down, but look right here. It's the greatest decision that you could ever make. One of our ways of communicating, whether that's a prayer need or you're a first-time visitor or you gave your life to Jesus, is to write down your name. Check the box, I accepted Christ. Drop that in the offering box as our faithful fellowship gives to the tithes and offerings of this church to change the world. You drop that in that box as your gift to us. That is this tarot portion. Somebody's going to call you this week, or you can go to the guest relations counter, pick up a free Bible if you don't have one. We would love to give you that as a gift. But I want you at the 11 o'clock hour to hear the thunderous applause of people that are saying to you, welcome to the family of God. So come on, church. Let's put our hands together and say Welcome to the family of God. Praise be the Lord. Amen.